Many serial killers, such as Dennis Nilsson, are only discovered after neighbors notice unusual smells. Canada's candidate for most savage psycho killer had a practical solution to the problem of multiple rotting bodies. Robert Picton fed his victims to his pigs. He is charged with the murder of just six women, but is implicated in the deaths of at least 60. Robert William Willies Picton was born in a suburb of Vancouver, Port Coquitlam, in British Columbia in 1949. He and his brother and sister inherited the family farm when their parents died in the 1970s. The pig farm may have been 30 miles from Vancouver, but as the city expanded, Picton started to sell off parts of his land to encroaching housing estates and shopping centers. One of the places that escaped development that Picton liked to visit was downtown Eastside. It was from this area that he procured prostitutes for his social club nights at the aptly named Piggy's Palace. He found it surprisingly easy to entice women with the promise of drink, drugs, and money, but perhaps surprisingly for a sex-obsessed serial killer, he didn't drink or smoke. Neighbors remember him as a quiet but hard-working man who would either work on the farm or on his salvage business. It was one of his workers, Bill Hiscox, who first fingered Picton as a suspect. The police were aware of Picton because he had attacked a prostitute in 1997, but the case had been dropped. Despite this, he was still blacklisted by many prostitutes who also suggested to police that Picton might be responsible for the rise in missing women from downtown Eastside. But how and who Picton killed is still difficult to comprehensively establish even today because of both the method of his disposal and the judicial ban on reporting. The prosecution alleged that he would lure his victims with money and drugs and cocaine traces were found in a lot of recovered tissue samples. After sex, he then strangled or shot his victims. He would then feed their remains into his wood chipper and serve the remains to his pigs. One of the few first-hand witnesses to Picton's work was Lynn Ellingson. She lived briefly in a trailer on Picton's farm and said she walked in on a blood-covered Picton as a Ms. Georgina Pappin's body dangled from a chain in the farm's slaughterhouse. He disposed of Serena Abatsway's head, hands, and feet in a bucket which he placed in a freezer, where he also left bits of Andrea Josbury's body, including her severed head. He disposed of other parts, such as the jawbones of Marnie Frey and Brenda Wolf, and the head and hands of Mona Wilson in dustbins, manure, and pig pens. When Picton slaughtered the pigs that had been fed on slaughtered humans, he would sell on the pork. Large numbers of women started disappearing off the streets of Vancouver in the 1980s, but they were mainly prostitutes, drug addicts, or aboriginal women who operated in downtown East Side, Canada's poorest postcode. With no public pressure and without any bodies to start a murder case, the police refused for years to treat the women as anything but missing, let alone connect them to becoming prey to a single predator. But then an aboriginal group provided a list of missing women to the police, and Detective Dave Dixon officially started an investigation in 1998. The first Vancouver policeman to suspect a serial killer was at work was Kim Rosmo. He would later become a criminology professor and originator of geographic profiling. He speculated that the killer was deliberately targeting women who would be invisible to the authorities. Even when the police realized they had a serial killer and that Picton was a suspect, he was not placed under surveillance. On the 5th of February, 2002, police, armed with a search warrant, entered the Picton farm looking for illegal firearms. Within hours of the 57-year-old being in custody, the police obtained a second court order to search the farm as part of the ongoing 20-year police investigation into the disappearance of over 60 women from downtown. The search by dozens of forensic-suited investigators amongst the slurry and dirt turned up an asthma inhaler belonging to one of the many missing, but the police could only charge Picton with minor firearm contraventions. Later released, he was now under police surveillance. A few weeks later, the police arrested and charged Picton with two counts of first-degree murder for the killings of Serena Abotsway and Mona Wilson. A fortnight later, the names of Heather Bottomley, Jacqueline McDonnell, and Diane Rock were added to the charges. One week later, Andrea Josbury became the sixth charge. With the addition of Heather Chinnick, Tanya Hollick, Sherry Irving, and Inga Hall, the total murder charges reached 15, making Picton Canada's biggest formally charged serial killer. By this stage, 
Large conveyor belts were being used to shift through tons of soil, going as deep as 30 feet down for sifting and DNA analysis by over 100 forensic specialists. It broke new ground for forensics. They had found blood-stained clothes and pieces of human bone and teeth. Amongst a pile of animal bones, human toes, heels, and rib bones were found. By November, there were nearly 30 charges against Picton, but investigators were constantly thwarted by the conditions on the farm and the fact that Picton's pigs had helped in the disposal of the evidence. While Picton was waiting for the trial, a Royal Canadian mounted police officer had gone undercover and pretended to be a cellmate. Picton confessed to 49 murders. He expressed annoyance not to have rounded up to a 50 and regretted only that he become sloppy, which had led to his arrest. During the trial, Picton sat expressionless behind a bulletproof screen as relatives of more than 60 women looked to him for answers. Fearing a mistrial due to contempt or prejudice, the judge had banned any reporting of the case details of Canada's most prolific serial killer. The sheer volume of DNA evidence meant that the judge divided the trial into two. The first part would deal with just six of the charges with the remaining 20 to be heard at a later date. After 130 witnesses and 10 months of trial, it took the jury of seven men and five women 10 days to reach their verdict, and on a Sunday, Picton was convicted of second-degree murder of the six women whose remains were found on his Vancouver farm. On the following Tuesday, Robert William Picton was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years, the longest sentence possible under Canadian law. Justice James Williams said, Mr. Picton, there is really nothing that I can say to adequately express the revulsion the community feels about these killings. As the verdict was read, two female jurors wiped away tears while Picton finally showed some emotion. He smirked. 